Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you The Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore, with music by Claude Sweeten. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. With quality foods in such big demand, it's only natural that more and more families should want to buy parquet margarine. Parquet's quality is known from coast to coast. And parquet's delicious flavor is preferred by millions to any other brand. So that explains, in large part, why you can't always get parquet margarine these days at your favorite food store. It's simply because more and more families are buying this spread that tastes so good. Kraft wants to assure you, however, that everything possible is being done to keep dealers supplied. All available parquet margarine is distributed fairly and equitably. So if you can't get parquet the very first time, try again, won't you? The chances are that right soon your dealer will have a new supply. Look for and ask for Parquet, the nourishing spread that tastes so good. Now for the great Gildersleeve. On a fine May morning, he steps out on his veranda to survey his property and incidentally see what his new neighbor is up to across the street. He finds his nephew, Leroy, returning from reconnaissance. Leroy? Yeah? Come here a minute. What do you want? What's going on over there? What are those men doing? Oh, they're gardeners. One of them's cutting down the hedge. The hedge? What for? I don't know. Mr. Bullard just told me he wanted to cut down, that's all. He said he couldn't see. Oh, he did, did he? By George, if he cuts down his hedge, I'm going to let mine grow up. I'm not going to have Bullard spying on me. He's not spying on anybody, Unc. He's just trying to fix the place up. Yeah? It's going to be swell. Mr. Bullard says he's going to have those old barberry bushes ripped out and have all new planting there. Rhododendrons. He's going to fix it up swell. Oh, he is, is he? Well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking of doing some fixing up around this place. Yes. Yeah, I know. You keep talking, but you never I do... mean it. Now, those bushes there in front of the porch. Those Barbary bushes. Never did like those. Too scraggly. You ought to dig them out. All those? Certainly. I think it would look better with something else in there. Might decide to put in some, well, some rhododendrons, maybe. Yes. Why not? That'd be great. Well, I guess I'll be going over to see... Leroy... Yeah? While you're resting, my boy. Yeah? Out in the garage to the left of the workbench, you will find a spading fork. Bring it. He. <laughs> yes, by George, we may not be millionaires here. We may not be able to afford a staff of gardeners. But that's no reason we can't have this place looking just as well as the Bullards. <laughs> You're not handling the fork right, Leroy. I'm not? No. You show me. I don't need to show you. Just do as I say. Throw your weight behind it. Why doesn't he throw his weight behind it? (laughs) Confound it, Leroy. You're not trying. I am so. Don't just peck at it. Here, give me that. Okay. No, you keep it. (laughs) Keep trying. For corn's sake. Hey, here comes Mrs. Ransom. Oh. Good morning, Trothmorton. Uh, hello, Leela. Isn't it a lovely morning? I saw you were gardening, too, so I just had to run over. Hello, Leroy. Having fun. Huh. <laughs> Say, you're looking mighty cute this morning, Leela. It's my gardening hat. I just love gardening, don't you? Love it. Keep digging, Leroy. <laughs> doing here anyway, Throckmorton? I'm digging out all these Barbary bushes. He's digging them. Mm, my, that's quite a job. You're not kidding. These things have roots. What we need is more manpower here, Leroy. Where's Bertie? You won't get her. She started spring cleaning. Well, uh, where's Marjorie then? I don't know. Up in her room, I suppose. You go up and tell her to come down. Okay. She spends entirely too much time in her room. 
Go up and tell her, Leroy. <laughs> that boy has the soul of a train announcer. Throckmorton, I noticed Mr. Bullard is fixing up his place over there, too. So I noticed. Well, I believe he's even got a man digging out his barberry bushes. Yeah. Well, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Don't you like Mr. Bullard, Throckmorton? I thought him rather charming the only time I met him. Mr. Bullard is a snob, and you may tell him I said so, Leela. Him and his DeSoto. I don't understand. Well, I won't go into details. But Judge Hooker and I tried to pay him a neighborly visit the other day when he was moving in his furniture, and the guy was too busy to speak to us. Well, of course, there's nothing worse than moving. That's all right. He needn't speak to us if he don't want to. But just wait till he wants a favor. Wait till they really move into that house, and he wants to get his water turned on. Ha! He'll darn well wait his turn. He'll be lucky if he gets water by July. He'll be lucky if he doesn't have to bring it in on donkey back. In goat skins. Oh, here's Marjorie. Good morning, Marjorie. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. Uncle Mort Leroy said you told me to come downstairs. That's true, my dear, I did. Well, here I am. What do you want? I want you to get outdoors. Get some fresh air. Enjoy yourself. Here it is, a nice day. Is that what you got me down here for? Well, I think it's bad for you to stay cooped up in your room all the time. Your uncle's right, Marjorie. It's not good to stay indoors all the time. You're looking pale. Yes. Look at Mrs. Ransom. Look at the color in her cheeks. Why don't you be like her? Uncle Mort, you won't let me use rouge, and you know it. What? (laughs) (laughs) Now, my dear, I'm afraid you misunderstood. I just don't want you locking yourself up in your room all the time. Will you kindly tell me what else there is to do in this town? Well, there are lots of things. Name one. Well, you could do a little gardening. I loathe and despise gardening. Oh, but gardening can be fun. Now, Leroy's been helping me here. Yes, and why do you think he's hiding upstairs right now? Why the little... Here's Leroy and I. Yeah, you see? Hey! Listen to this. Dear diary. Leroy. What is there worth living oh, for? There's not a boy in this town you can have an intelligent discussion with. Leroy. All the cute ones are in the army and all the intelligent ones are... Leroy, in the... give me that. Leroy. Okay. Leroy, I hate you. What did I do? I think you're all hateful, all of you. Why, well, Marjorie, honey. Don't honey me. If there's one thing I can't... What's the matter with her? She's going up to her room again, Unc. Yes, young man, and you're going up to yours. Oh. Then wait for me there. Gosh, Unc. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. Just found the diary lying there, and I thought you'd like to hear it, so I just... Okay, I'll go. (laughs) I'm sorry, Leela. Marjorie should have apologized. Oh, that's all right, Throckmorton. She's not a shelf, that's all. I'm worried about that girl. I don't understand her. All she does is stick around the house and mope and read. Too much reading isn't good for a girl at that age. It gives them ideas. I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry, Throckmorton. She'll forget it all. Gracious, I've forgotten every word I ever read. Uh, Tell me, how old is Marjorie? Why, uh, let's see. She's, uh... Sixteen, I guess. I don't know. Well, no wonder. No wonder what? Down where I come from, Throckmorton, girls start getting married when they're fourteen. Huh? And at fifteen, they worry about being old maids. I don't see what that's got to do with Marjorie. Did it ever occur to you that she might be human? Huh? Think it over, Throckmorton. My little Marjorie. I wonder if Leela's right. Uh, Mr. Gilsey, that Mr. Bullard from across the street's here. Mr. Bullard, what does he want? I don't know, sir. Shall I tell him you stepped out? No, send him in. I've been waiting for this. Hee <laughs> hee. This is the moment. Yes, sir. <laughs> he thinks he's going to get his water turned on. He's telling that again. Uh, come right in, Mr. Bullard. Mr. Gilsey says he's been waiting for you. I didn't tell her to say that. Well, well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, good day. Uh, excuse me, I'll just get my vacuum clean out of your way here. I uh, just dropped over, Mr. Gildersleeve, to say that I'm afraid I owe you an apology. Oh? I don't know what for. Uh, for my behavior the other evening when you dropped by. I'm afraid perhaps I seemed a little abrupt. 
I didn't notice anything. Well, I didn't mean to. But uh, I'd had the devil's own time. You know, moving day, worst darn thing in the world. The wife usually takes care of those sort of things, but, uh, uh, say, this is a nice place you've got here. Well, it's not as large as some. Well, I like it. Comfortable. Shows real taste. None of this modern stuff. Oh, thanks. Uh, will you sit down? Well, I don't care if I do. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, don't suppose you'd smoke a cigar. Don't care if I do. <laughs> yeah. oh, I like a man who smokes a cigar. I never trust a man who doesn't. Mr. Gildersleeve, I can see that you and I are going to get along together. I'll tell you after I've smoked the cigar. <laughs> I say we haven't got the place straightened out yet, but we're moving in today anyway, the whole kit and caboodle. Well, I hope you and your wife are going to like it here in Summerfield. Oh, we'll like it. I was brought up in this town, you know. Uh, the only one I'm concerned about is my oldest boy, Marshall. Uh, he's been going to prep school in the East, and now he's switching to public school, and, well, it'll do him good, I say. He may knock some notions out of his head. How old did you say he was? Seventeen. Very difficult age. You're telling me. I have a niece here who's sixteen. Well, well, that's fine. Maybe we can get them together one of these days, huh? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, mighty glad to meet you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Mighty glad to meet you, Mr. Bullard. <laughs> I expect we'll be seeing a lot of each other now that we're neighbors. Yes, indeed. Now that you know the way, come often. <laughs> <laughs> you know... I'll tell you something. The first time I saw you across the street, I didn't think I was going to like you. I'm going to tell you something. I didn't think I was going to like you either. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just goes to show. Oh, uh, by the way. Yes? You said you were with the water department, didn't you? Yeah, I, I'm in charge of it. Well, I feel like a fool. I forgot to do anything about getting my water turned on. And oh, now... don't give it a thought. The whole thing will be attended to. Uh, you sure you don't mind? Mr. Bullard, it'll be a distinct pleasure. I'll even waive the customary deposit. <laughs> ah, nice fellow. Yes, by George, as nice a fellow as you'd want to meet. And with all that money. Mind if I dust around you, Mr. Gilsley? Oh, go right ahead, Bertie. I'll just sit here and enjoy my cigar. Yes, sir. Given to me by Mr. Bullard. Custom made. He buys them in lots of 500. He seems real nice, that Mr. Bullard. Nice of fellows you'd want to meet. Rich, too. <sighs> Tells me he has a son Marjorie's age. Is that a fact? I ain't seen him around. Well, the family's not arriving till this afternoon. <sighs> <laughs> Our little Marjorie's growing up, you know, Bertie. Well, it happens to all of them. Yes, I suppose she'll be getting married one of these days. <laughs> You think a man off to that bullet family, Mr. Gilfleet? Yeah. Well, she could do worse. Well, I guess they got plenty of money if that's what you want. Oh, I wouldn't want anything myself, Bertie. Any kind of financial settlement or anything, that would be out. But I might go and visit them now and then after they were married. <laughs> I bet. Hi, <laughs> uh, George. They'd make a handsome couple, you know. You ain't even laid eyes on the boy yet, Mr. Gilsey. Well, if he's anything like his father, what a wedding. Champagne, flowers by the carload, a three-piece orchestra, articles in all the newspapers. And there I'd be in my full-dress suit giving away the bride. And me in a new silk uniform giving away wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. If you're packing lunches, remember that every lunch should provide at least one-third of the energy and other essential food elements your children at school and grown-ups at work need for good nutrition. It's important, too, that you pack foods that taste good. So here's a grand suggestion. Include in each lunchbox nourishing sandwiches of bread or rolls spread with delicious parquet margarine. Parquet tastes so good and is so high in food energy value, too... It's doubly sure to satisfy hungry appetites. And remember, Kraft fortifies every single pound of parquet with 9,000 units of vitamin A. So in meals you serve at home and in the lunches you prepare for school or work, 
Be sure to include Parquet, the nourishing spread that tastes so good. Buy Parquet, the delicious spread millions prefer to any other brand. Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Made by Kraft. Now let's rejoin the great Gildersleeve. He spent some happy hours dreaming of a marriage of convenience for his niece Marjorie, which would include a convenient old age for himself. Now it occurs to him to take steps to make his dream an actuality, so we find him arriving at Peavy's Drugstore to consult the Oracle. Well, where's Peavy? An early summer nap, I guess. Oh, Peavy. Peavy. <laughs> Sorry to disturb you, Peavy. Oh, it's you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Huh? What can I do for you this afternoon? Peavy, how do you think you're going to get anywhere in business if you spend your time asleep in the back room? You'll never get rich that way. Well, not. I wouldn't say that. Huh? I suppose you're going to say you weren't asleep. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I was leaning back in the chair out there, and I may have dropped off just for a minute. Uh, what time is it? Three o'clock. Back room must be stuffy. I went out there about 12.30. <laughs> well, sir, what can I do for you? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't going to buy anything, Peavy. But seeing I woke you up... Well, you don't have to buy anything, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm much obliged to you. Well, I just wanted to talk to you. I, am. Um... I'm thinking of marrying my niece, Marjorie. Well, I hope you'll be very happy. What did you say? <laughs> Peavy, I'm think of, thinking of marrying her off to, to somebody else. Mm, I was going to say you're a little old for her. <laughs> now I think of it, she's a little young to get married, isn't she? Well, I don't know. Her mind seems to be full of nothing but nonsense about love. Maybe the only way to cure it is to let her get married. That makes you think that'll cure it. <laughs> Well, a married woman soon learns that life is a matter of bringing up children and running a household, not dreaming about romance. She does? Well, gosh, doesn't she? Mr. Gildersleeve, last week I caught Mrs. Peavy cutting a picture of Sonny Tufts out of a magazine. <laughs> you don't say. In fact, and I gave her quite a talking to. My gracious woman, I said, why don't you pick someone your own age, like Barry Fitzgerald, I said. And she said he was too old for her. Made me kind of shy about the whole thing up. Well, I'm tired of arguing with Marjorie. Let her argue with her husband. Have you uh, anyone in mind, or are you just looking around? Well, I understand Rumson Bullard has a boy about 17, my new neighbor. I thought you weren't speaking to him. Listen, Rumson Bullard is a fine fellow, and don't let anybody tell you different. I ought to see the cigar he gave me this morning. No. Mm. Well, he's got this boy, Peavy. Now, he and Marjorie, they're both about the same age, and they live right across the street from each other. The only problem is how to get them together. Mr. Gildersleeve, I'd say all you have to do is just let nature take its course. Nature? That's no way. No, no I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Nature's a powerful force, Mr. Gildersleeve. Look at Niagara Falls. Drip, drip, drip for 3,000 years, but she made it. <laughs> I don't want Marjorie to wait 3,000 years, Peavy. Besides, if I just let nature take its course, how do I know that Marjorie won't marry some fellow that plays a saxophone and hasn't got a dime? You, you never know how a woman's mind is going to work. Mr. Gildersleeve, you said it. <laughs> well, what am I going to do, Peavy? Don't ask me. Ask a woman. But you've been through all this. I mean... Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't know anything about women. I just married one. <laughs> Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you, Leela, is that I think you're right. Marjorie ought to get married, and I've picked out the man. Oh, Throckmorton, how exciting. Who is he? Rumson Bullard's older boy. I was wrong about Bullard. Nice family. Well, how old is the boy? Seventeen. That's a little young, of course. Yeah, Marjorie's known boys her own age before, and they've never even tried to hold her hand. Really? George William Hungerford asked me to marry him on his 17th birthday. Gosh, I had to help him a little. Well... <laughs> I may have to help out Bullard's boy. Oh, you can't do it, silly. Marjorie's the only one that can help him. Well, how? How did you get George William Hungerford to pop the question? Don't you wish you knew, Throckmorton? 
Well, was George William the first one that asked you? Of course he was. Oh, no, wait a minute, he wasn't either. Mercy, I'd forgotten all about poor Custis Dupree. Yeah, uh, well, what happened to Custis? He was the first one. His voice cracked in the middle of it. <laughs> Look, Leela, what I want to know is how you brought these fellows to the point. Well, now, let me see. Custis was easy. I just dared him to kiss me. But George William was more difficult. He was simply mad about horseback riding. Well, what's that got to do with it? Made things very complicated. He used to take me out riding, but every time we'd be riding along nice and cozy, side by side, and he'd start to get serious, that horse of his would rear up and gallop off down the path. Well, then why didn't you make George Williams stay home and sit in the parlor? He was hopeless in the parlor. Tongue-tied? And handcuffed. But I... <laughs> I figured it out. One day we were out riding. I made my horse run away. I galloped away from George Williams, and as soon as I was out of sight, I got off and gave him a slap, and off he went for home. George Williams? No, the horse. When George William caught up with me, I told him I'd been thrown. Leela, you're a devil. I suppose you cried, huh? No, no, I was brave. I don't look my best when I cry. <laughs> anyway, he picked me up. He was terribly strong and just, just swung me up on the saddle. And then he got up behind me and we rode home. But what made him propose? Well, my goodness, Throckmorton, he had his arms around me for 14 miles. By George. Let's go horseback riding sometime, Leela. What for? Well, I... You're right. <laughs> Why go horseback riding unless you're hopeless in the parlor? Come here, Leela. Throckmorton. Huh? What's the matter? I'm afraid you've forgotten what you came over for. It's Mr. Bullard's boy that needs the help, remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although if he's anything like you, Marjorie will need it. <laughs> now, Leela, I've always been a gentleman. Well, I suppose as Yankees go. Gosh, I hope Bullard's boy don't need anything as complicated as a runaway horse to get him started. But if that's what he needs, by George, he'll have it. Supper smells good. Shoulder of lamb, Mr. Gillsleeve. Mighty funny, all of a sudden, all the lambs got shoulders, none of them got legs. Well, the legs have gone to war, Bertie. Uh, where's Marjorie? She's out in the backyard with some boy. Some boy? Uh, what boy? I don't know who he is, Mr. Gillsleeve. They're just out there sitting in the swing talking. You can see him from the window here. Huh? Where? Let me see, Bertie. Well, I don't like his looks. I'll send him home, that's all. I'll... Gee, wait a minute. Maybe that's young Bullard. Is that who it is, Bertie? I don't know, Mr. Gillsleeve. Leroy might know. Why, George, the kid looks like Bullard. I wonder... Leroy! Leroy here? Yes, he's around somewhere. Leroy! Lee... You calling me, Unc? Yes. Who's that boy out there with Marjorie, you know? That's Marshal Bullard. He came over about half an hour ago. Well, well. Maybe nature's not so bad after all. Huh? Nothing, Leroy. <laughs> That's all, my boy. Okay. Gosh, I thought he wanted me to do something. Well, Bertie, that's the young man. Marshall. Marshall and Marjorie. Make a fine-looking couple, don't they? They might in a few years. Oh, sooner than that, Bertie. Sooner than that. All right, George, I think I'll just tiptoe out there and see how they're doing. Uh, you like music, Marshall? Yeah. I'm crazy about about Brahms and Chopin. Do you like that kind of music? Oh, I like classical music, but not for a steady diet. Well, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not exclusively classical. Oh, don't get me wrong, Marjorie. I'm not knocking classical. Oh, no. I love the Basie record of One O'Clock Jump. All his records are great. I think so, too. I uh, <laughs> saw him in New York once at Radio City. Did you? Gee, I've only heard his record. He looks just like his pictures. Do you like Artie Shaw? I like him pretty well. Do you? Yeah, pretty well. Do you like to read? Oh, I read all the time. 
Do you like poetry? Uh, pretty well. Oh, brother, they'll never get anywhere this way. <laughs> well, Marjorie, I, I didn't know you were out here. Oh, company. Hello, Uncle Mort. This is Marshall Bullard. This is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, well, my boy, sit down, sit down. I'm delighted to meet you. Glad to have you in the neighborhood. I guess Marjorie's glad, too. Aren't you, Marjorie? Aren't you, Marjorie? Sure, I guess so. Why don't you sit over there with Marjorie, my boy, and I'll sit on this side. I'm getting a little, uh, stout. Oh, you're not really, Uncle Mord. <laughs> nice girl. That's okay. <laughs> I'll stand up. Stand up? <laughs> you're not afraid of my niece, are you? Oh, Uncle Mord. Huh? Uh, your dad and I are going to be great friends, uh, Marshall, and we want you to feel at home over here. Thanks a lot, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Say, why don't you stay for supper tonight? Glad to have you. Oh, no, I don't think I'd better. Why not? Come on, coax it, Marjorie. Why should I? Marjorie. I think I'd better be going. Mr. Gildersleeve, it's probably my supper time, too. Well, come back afterwards. Oh, we can't tonight, Uncle Moore. Why not? I have to do my homework. Homework? Well, I'll tell you. How would you both like to go horseback riding tomorrow, huh? <laughs> do you like horseback riding, Marshall? Uh, I like it pretty well. Well, I've never been on a horse in my life, and you know it, Uncle Mort. Why, Marjorie. Gosh, neither have I. Well, you can learn together. We'll get two nice, gentle horses, and you can take a long ride in the country. I won't do it. Marjorie. You'd better go now, Marshal. Maybe I'll see you around. Huh? Oh, sure. Well, good night. Wait a minute. Uh, good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. There he goes. Marjorie, look what you've done. What I've done? You're the stupidest uncle a girl ever had. And you're fat, too. Oh. <laughs> you go in the house. I've done anything, I'm sorry. It was all my fault. I guess I just haven't any tact, that's all. I guess I'm just a blundering idiot. I guess I'm just a fat old fool. But you don't have to sit there and agree with me. We were getting along so nicely. Now he'll never come back again. Don't you worry. I'll fix it all up for you. Oh, no. Well, you cheer up right now, young lady, or I will. Oh, no, please. I'll be all right. I'm fine now. I feel wonderful. Promise you won't say anything to Marshall. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, George, don't tell me I don't know how to handle kids. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Music on this program was directed by Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of Sarkey Margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. In these days of food shortages, certainly no one's wasting important leftovers. But do you know the trick of making leftovers not seem like leftovers at all? It's easy with Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. First, make a luscious golden cheese sauce with Pabstet and a little milk. Then pour this tempting Pabstet cheese sauce on leftovers of meat, fish, vegetables, or rice, fixed any way you like. Presto, Pabstet has helped create a brand new main dish, rich in mellow cheddar cheese flavor. You can serve nourishing Pabstet many other ways, too. Toasted in sandwiches, melted with macaroni, or sliced to serve with fruits and pie for dessert. You can buy Pabstet in two delicious varieties. Golden Pabstet in the yellow package and Pimento Pabstet in the red package. Treat your family to both kinds. Ask for Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The 
Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore, with music by Claude Sweet. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Today, there are many different brands of margarine in the food stores. Here's a simple test for flavor your own family can make. Buy Kraft's parquet margarine, spread it on piping hot toast, and then compare parquet's fine flavor and aroma with any other spread you may have used. You see, heat brings out the flavor of foods. So notice especially how fresh, how delicate, how satisfying this delicious flavor is when parquet melts into tempting golden brown slices of toast. Prove to your own satisfaction how good parquet tastes. And then you'll know why millions prefer parquet to any other brand. Remember, parquet is a vitamin-fortified food with 9,000 units of vitamin A guaranteed in every pound. It's tops in food energy value, too. So buy parquet, the delicious spread millions prefer to any other brand. P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend the Great Gildersleeve, whom we meet this evening as a member of the Summerfield School Board. In this capacity, he's attending a meeting of the Parent Teachers Association in the auditorium of the Summerfield Grammar School with Miss Eve Goodwin as chairman. Meeting, he says. Well, it would be a meeting, except that so far nobody but Gildersleeve and Miss Goodwin have showed up. What time is it, Throckmorton? Time? Uh, 8.15, Eve. What time is the meeting supposed to start? At 8. Wouldn't it be awful if nobody came? It would suit me fine. I'll tell you what, Eve. Let's lock the doors right now so nobody can get in. <laughs> Frock Morton, what on earth for? Then you and I could play school. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. I'll be the naughty boy and you make me stay after. How about it? Oh, don't be childish, Frock Morton. Childish? Don't you even want to know what I did that was naughty? I wrote something naughty on the blackboard. All right. What was it? I love teacher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please, can I stay after school, teacher? No, Throckmorton. Go home and write out the multiplication table 50 times. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get out of here, Eve. Nobody's coming. We know Judge Hooker's coming because we announced him as our principal speaker. We sent out over 200 postcards. Announcing Judge Hooker would speak? Of course. Well, no wonder nobody's here. <laughs> People don't want to listen to that old goat bleeding at them. The judge is highly respected in the community, Throckmorton. He has a great many admirers. Yeah, and they're all sitting right here waiting for him to speak. Count them. Well, I don't understand it. When you send a... There's someone at the door now. If it's a fan of Judge Hooker's, I want to see him. Well, by George, it is at that. Hello, Judge. Hi, Gildy. Good evening, gracious lady. Good evening, Judge. Well, where's our audience? I was just going to ask you that, Judge. You're the main attraction this evening, I believe. Maybe nobody wants to hear that speech of yours anymore. The law as the bulwark of freedom. My speech has nothing to do with tonight's attendance. The YMCA is giving a minstrel show tonight to raise money for a new pool table. That's where everybody's gone. Oh? Well, that's what we got to compete with, then. Entertainment. Yeah, but how can we compete? Well, Judge, I, I think your speech might have been a little closer to the subject of education. Just what I've been trying to say, Eve. Now, for instance, I might give a little talk on child psychology. You! I'm the authority on child psychology around this town. Juvenile delinquency, I call it. I just read a magazine article about it. So did I. Oh, please, Horace. Throckmorton. He raised his voice to me. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Eve, but Gildersleeve is so irritating. What? Throckmorton. <laughs> now, Horace, there's nothing to fight about. You both want to talk on child psychology. Now, why can't we have a debate? Debate? By George. Now, that's something people would come to hear. Uh, have you definite views on the subject, Throckmorton? Have I? I told you I read this article. And you, Judge? I can put my views on juvenile delinquency in a nutshell. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Yeah, I might have known that's how you'd look at it, Judge. Kid steals a pack of chewing gum and you'd send him up for five years. <laughs> I'd do nothing of the kind. On the other hand, I wouldn't just give him a pat on the back. Shh. It's old dodos like you that make juvenile delinquency a problem. And it's ignorant boneheads like you that make it more difficult. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, hold your fire. We'll stage the debate a week from tonight. And may the best man win. I'm a cinch. 
Leroy? Yeah? Where's that little magazine that was lying around the parlor yesterday? Magazine Digest. Yesterday? It's been kicking around here for days. Now when I want it, I can't find it. Yep, I know how it is, Unc. The philosopher, even. <clears throat> you haven't seen the magazine? Had an article on child psychology in it. Nope. Did you ask Bertie? She hadn't seen it. Oh, well, I guess I can remember enough of it. Let's see. Maybe if I could make a sort of an outline. <sighs> haven't you anything to do, Leroy? Not a thing. Well, find something. You make me nervous just sitting there while I'm trying to work. Okay. Leroy! Leroy! Somebody calling you, Leroy? Yeah. Well, answer him. <laughs> he gods, there's a kid for you to play with. He's not a kid. He's just a little boy. Well, play with him anyway. Leroy! Leroy's in here, Sonny. Come on in. Oh, for corn's sake. He's too little. Hello, Leroy. What you doing? Nothing. Manners, Leroy. I don't believe I know you, young man. What's your name? Craig. He's Craig Bullard. Oh, another one of the Bullard family. Well, well, I've met your brother Marshall, and I've met your dad. And you're Craig. Well, quite a family. Let's play, Leroy. Play what? My father gave me this magic trick. But I don't know how it works. Magic? Let's see. Hey, this is the Mahatma's magic box. Cost eight seventy-five. How does it work? Well, I'll show you how it works, Craig. Now, look, you sit down here on the sofa, and I'll show you the trick. Holy cow, the Mahatma's magic box, eight seventy-five. You be careful with Craig's expensive trick, Leroy. I can handle it. Look, Craig, you see, I take this quarter, and I open the door of the Mahatma's magic box. I place the quarter inside, and I close the door. Now, the quarter's in there, isn't it? It's in there all right, isn't it? I don't know. You just saw me put it in. You can hear it. You hear it? Yes, I hear it. But now I open the door of the Mahatma's box, and we do not see the quarter. Open the other door. The other door? Oh. We open the other door, but the quarter has vanished. You moved it. Open the other door. The other door? We open the other door? No quarter. You moved it again. Open both doors. I have opened both doors. I open this door, no quarter. I open the other door, no quarter there either. Open both doors at the same time. What? Open both doors at the same time. <laughs> he got it. Oh, both doors at the same time. Very well. But where's the quarter? Well, I'll be. Was it really in there, Leroy? Well, sure. You saw me put the quarter in, didn't you, Craig? I thought so. Where did it go? That's a magic. Uh, look, Craig, this is a kind of a tough trick to learn. How'd you like to trade it for something easier? Leroy. <laughs> What's the matter? No swindling, please. Oh, I won't jip him. You want to trade this for something easier, Craig? Okay. I wonder if you and Craig could do your trading upstairs, my boy. I'm trying to do some work here. Oh, sure. Come on, Craigie, old boy. I'll show you all my magic stuff. He's going to swindle him. I'd rather he did it where I can't hear the details. <laughs> Uh -huh. Now, let's see here. I suppose Hooker will have a lot of statistics. That kind of stuff. Maybe I should throw in a few. Uh, <clears throat> it may surprise my esteemed opponent to learn that in six large cities where corporal punishment was abolished last year, uh, juvenile delinquency fell off uh, 19%. wonder if you'll know I made that up. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Hey! Now, now, what's the matter here? He took my magic box away from me. I did not. He took it away. Leroy, let me have the facts. I didn't take it. We traded. He said he'd trade the box for my Egyptian changing bag. Is that right, Craig? Are you willing to trade your box for the bag? The bag is torn. I want my box. <laughs> is the bag torn, Leroy? Just a small tear. Hardly shows at all. Outside of that, it's in perfect condition. How much is the bag worth? Uh, I don't remember exactly. Well, it wasn't worth any 875 brand new, was it? No. But they're hard to get now. Or they will be one of these days. <laughs> they might stop making them. Leroy, give the boy his box. You run upstairs with Leroy, Craig, and you'll get your box back. Thank you. I'll tell you what 
that'll do, Craig. If you don't like the changing bag, I got a set of Chinese rings. Upstairs, Leroy. Okie doke. I think you'll like the things, Craig. Leroy certainly sticks to the thing when he wants to. Yes, sir, there's a lot of bulldog gilders leaving that boy. <laughs> Well, come on, Bulldog, get your teeth in old Judge Hooker here. Let's see, I was throwing statistics at him. Oh, yes, the average rainfall... Craig, for Pete's sake, be reasonable. I want my box. Leroy, give him his box. He took my magic box away from me. I did not, it was a trade. Gosh, Uncle, he made the trade, the changing bag and the Chinese rings. Well, that sounds fair enough. What's wrong with that? The bag is torn and the rings are rusty. <laughs> I'm tired of this, Leroy. Stop trying to get Craig's box away from him and just play nicely. Play what? Go out in the backyard and play catch or something sensible and healthy. Can you catch a ball, Craig? Sure. He can't, Uncle. He's a butterfinger. Well, teach him. Ye gods, I'm busy. write out every syllable I'm going to say there, as long as I have the general idea. Now what? Some more kids, I suppose. Come in. Are you Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, uh, yes, I am. Uh, pardon me, I thought it was someone I knew at the door. I'm Mrs. Bullard from across the street. Well, well, this is indeed a pleasure. Now I've met the whole family. There's a youngster of yours around here somewhere playing with my nephew. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I... I thought I saw Craig come over here. Yes, he's here. Seems like a mighty nice boy, too. I'm glad if he's made a good impression, because I... I wanted to ask you to do us a favor. Uh, do me a favor. Anything at all, Mrs. Bullard, anything at all. Well, I've just managed to make an appointment at the hairdresser's, and I wondered if I could leave Craig over here for the next couple of hours. Is that all? <laughs> Well, I thought you were going to ask a real favor. Craig is having such a good time with Leroy. That's nothing, Mrs. Bullard. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've got to run now, but I'll pick up Craig as soon as I get back. Don't have him on your mind. Well, pleasant woman. Seems a little young for Bullard. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve. Huh? Oh, what is it, Bertie? I guess I'll be going now. Going? Going where? Did you forget? You told me I could take this afternoon off, and it's 12 o'clock right now. By George, Bertie, I had forgotten. Well, go along, Bertie. Yes, sir. I'll be back around 4.30. Goodbye, Miss Gilsey. Goodbye, Bertie. Have a good... Uh, oh, Bertie. What do you want, Miss Gilsey? On your way, just ask Leroy to come in here, will you? Leroy ain't here. He left with Piggy about a half hour ago. He left? What about that little boy that was with him? He's just sitting out there in the backyard by himself. Wait till I catch that Leroy. All right, Bertie. Thanks, anyway. You're welcome, Mr. Gilsey. Goodbye. Goodbye. Leroy has the manners of a pig. Well, maybe I'll get a chance to do some work on him this summer. Uh, let's see here. Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, what is it, Craig? I'm hungry. I want some lunch. <laughs> Bertie! Uh, Bertie! Confounded Craig. Why didn't you think of that five minutes ago? <laughs> Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. If there are any enthusiastic bread eaters in our listening audience, here's where you come in for a bit of special attention. It's you folks who enjoy bread, rolls, pancakes, and waffles who really appreciate fine flavor in a spread. And that's why so many homemakers are serving parquet margarine, the spread with a flavor that's truly delicious. Parquet is served daily in millions of American homes. In fact, millions prefer parquet to any other brand. So if you haven't already tried parquet... Get a package from the dealer who sells you craft food products and give those bread eaters in your family a real flavor treat. You'll be adding good nourishment to meals, too, because parquet is high in food energy value, and every single pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So buy parquet, the delicious spread millions prefer to any other brand. P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve, who finds himself with Bertie away, faced with the problem of providing lunch for himself and his little guest from across the street. Well, come on, Craig. Let's go out to the kitchen and see what's there, shall we? What say? I'm hungry. 
Yeah, I know you're hungry. I'm going to get you a nice big lunch. All the things you like, too. What's your favorite? Ice cream. Yes, I know. But that would hardly do for lunch now, would it? What would you like for lunch? Ice cream. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> now, you know as well as I do that we don't eat ice cream for lunch. Now, let's see what we have here. Well, we have raspberry jam, if you like that. Bread and jam. And here's a can of tuna. Mmm. You could have a tuna sandwich. Now, which would you like? Ice cream. <laughs> now, look, Craig, let's be reasonable, shall we? I've got work to do, and I've got to get back to it. We haven't any ice cream, and if we had some, you wouldn't be allowed to have it. Now, we've got all this nice stuff here. Make up your mind. Which is it going to be? What does your mother usually give you for lunch? Ice cream. All right, come on, we'll get some ice cream. Go ahead. Why are we going in here? Because you wouldn't eat what we had to offer at home. Is this where they have the ice cream? Yes, now go ahead. Well, hello, Mr. Gillistream. Hello, Peavy. Who's your young friend? This is Rumson Bullard, younger boy. Say hello to Mr. Peavy, Craig. How do you do? Oh, how do you do, Sonny? Okay, mannerly little fellow, isn't he? Well, yes, his manners are all right. <laughs> and what can I do for you today, young man? Well, Craig and I dropped in for a bite of lunch. Climb up on the stool there, Craig. Can you make it? Well, I should say so. My, you're a good climber, aren't you? I can climb trees, too. How'd you like to go and climb one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Craig's mother's gone out for a while, Peavy, so I get to take care of him. Well, now, isn't that nice? Uh-huh. <laughs> and what are you going to have for lunch, Sonny? Ice cream. Oh, but ice cream is for dessert. What are you going to have to start with? Ice cream. There's no use arguing with the child, Peavy. I've tried it. Just give him the ice cream. Well, perhaps you didn't put it to him the right way, Mr. Gildersleeve. A lot of people get impatient with children. That never works. No. You see, uh, Sonny, we don't start with ice cream. Oh, dear, no, because that would spoil our appetite, wouldn't it? It's no use, Peavy. Now, if you want ice cream, you'll have to eat something else first. You know, a sandwich or something? You understand? I tell you, it's no use. Now, we have all kinds of sandwiches here. Chopped eggs, Swiss cheese, tuna, tomato. I like tuna. Tuna it is. <laughs> Why, you look... I offered him a tuna sandwich at home, and he said he didn't want it. Well, perhaps the boy changed his mind, Mr. Gildersleeve. That's everybody's privilege. Huh. Now, there's your sandwich, Sonny. Want me to unwrap it for you? I can do it. Well, you're a big boy, aren't you? Fine lad. Fine lad. You see, Mr. Gildersleeve, you just have to know how to handle him. Don't forget my ice cream. No, indeed. Ice cream coming right up. Yes, sir. I've always found that reason works pretty well with children. Well, I'm not against it, you understand. I always try reason when everything else fails. But you can't count on it. <laughs> now, there's your dessert, Sonny. Thank you. Sandwich first, remember? All right, George, I'll say one thing for you, Peavy. You certainly have a way with kids. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, you have, definitely. I argued with him till I was black in the face. All you have to do is speak to him. Well, it's really very simple, Mr. Gildersleeve. You have to remember that children are people, that's all, just like you or me. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that, Peavy. I'm taking part in a debate with Judge Hooker tonight before the Parent Teachers Association. Yeah, I saw that in the paper. I was beginning to think maybe I was on the wrong side. Now, the judge, he thinks the only way to handle children is to get them into juvenile court and send them up for five years. Well, the judge has never had any children of his own. Just between you and me, I don't think he knows anything about it. <laughs> He's going to find that out this evening. I'm through. Can I have some water? Why, Craig, you've eaten your ice cream. And never touched your sandwich. Listen, you. Now, just a minute, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, Craig, you and I had an understanding, didn't we? You were to eat the sandwich first. But I didn't want the sandwich. Well, that makes no difference. We had an agreement. So I think you ought to eat the sandwich now. But I'm not hungry. I told you you wouldn't be hungry if you ate the ice cream first. But I'm going to have to ask you to eat the sandwich just the same. But I don't want to. Listen, do you want me to tell your mother you eat that sandwich? <laughs> but I'll get sick. Well, you ordered it. Now eat it. <laughs> 
Come along, Craig. I'm afraid we've annoyed Mr. Peavy. Spoiled little devil. If we were mine, I'd... Well, but he isn't. <laughs> Now, uh, let's see here. Where is it? Craig, have you been... Oh, here it is. Let's see. I say, uh... uh <clears throat> Miss Goodwin, my honored opponent, Judge Hooker, fellow members of the PTA... Where's Leroy? Where's Leroy? <laughs> I've told you, Craig, I don't know where Leroy is. I suspect he's hiding. I want Leroy to play with me. Well, he can't play with you. He isn't here. When will he be back? I don't know. Where did he go? For the hundredth time, I don't know where he went. I want him to play with me. (laughs) (laughs) Look, Craig, I'm trying to work here. It's very important. I've got just half an hour to finish this. Now, you go upstairs to Leroy's room and find something to do, or by George, I'll... Well, you go upstairs, that's all. I want Leroy to come with me. Leroy isn't here, ye gods! (laughs) Now what? If it isn't one thing, it's another. Well, Mrs. Bullard, so you're back. Oh, I must apologize. I'm afraid I'm terribly late. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> Come in. Is Craig here? Yes, indeed. He's been here every minute. Oh, Craig. Craigie, darling. Your mother's here. Come, Craig. Oh, I do hope he hasn't been too much trouble. Trouble? Not a bit. He's been a perfect little angel. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to hear it. Come, darling. Yes, indeed. Craig and I have gotten to be great friends. Haven't we, Craig? (laughs) Haven't we? (laughs) Mr. Gildersleeve asked you a question, dear. (laughs) Cat's got his tongue, I guess. Well, he's probably tired. Had a big day. Yes. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I I can't thank you enough. Oh, don't mention it. Glad to have him. Glad to have him any time. We had more fun, didn't we, Craig? (laughs) <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, goodbye. Goodbye. Give my regards to your husband. You must come over when we get settled. Oh, I will. Be delighted. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Well, maybe I can get something done around here for a change. <laughs> Where the devil was I? Hmm. Maybe I'm going at this thing wrong. If I give all my arguments at the start... The judge will refute them. But if I just stall and save all my arguments for the rebuttal, he won't get a chance to answer them. (laughs) The old goat, that'll burn him up. Who's that? Leroy? No, it's me. Oh, hello, Marjorie. Come on in, Marshal. Uncle Mort, you know Marshal. Oh, yes, yes. How do you do, sir? Your little brother just spent the whole day here. (laughs) Oh, that's so? Yeah. Over here, Marshal. Have you got the record? Yes. Is there a needle in that thing? Uh, Marjorie. Yes? If you don't mind, I'm doing a little work in here, so if you're planning to play the phonograph... Oh, that's all right. You won't bother us. <laughs> <laughs> well, rather than run any risk of that, my dear, I think perhaps I'll retire to my study. Oh, you're not disturbing us, Mr. Gildersleeve. Stick around. Yes, yeah, stick around, Uncle Mort. You'll love this. It's called Sad Sack. Play it, Marshal. <laughs> I give up. I give up. What's the matter, Uncle Moore? Everything. I've been trying all day to get two minutes to myself here, but no. And this is the last straw. To the to the when Bernie comes in, tell her I'll have my dinner served alone in my study. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He gets like that. Play it, Marshal. Yeah. All right, George, the judge is right about kids. You ought to send them up for five years. Every one. <laughs> no manners, no conscience. Come in. Oh, 
You can take the dishes, Bertie. I'm through. It ain't that. Miss Goodman and Judge Hooker are here to take you to the school meeting. Gee, what'll I tell Eve? I'm not prepared. L.A. Oh, coming, Judge. I haven't got much time. Meeting's called for eight. Be right with you, Horace. Well, hello, Eve. Good evening, Throckmorton. Hope you're in good form this evening, Gildy, because I'm prepared to give you the trouncing of your life in this debate. <laughs> well, I'm afraid there isn't going to be any debate this evening, Judge. Why not? Because you can't have a debate when two men are on the same side. What? Throckmorton, I don't understand. You mean that now, all of a sudden, you're in favor of corporal punishment for children? Eve, if you'd spent the day I've just spent, you'd be in favor of capital punishment. <laughs> Oh, well, really, with all those people down there at the meeting, what are we going to do? Now, don't get excited, Eve. I've got a better idea. Now, who wants to listen to a dull old debate? Do you judge? Do I? No. Entertainment. That's what they want. Now, I've got an idea that's going to be great. We can bring it up before the meeting tonight. What's that, Gildy? Why don't we put on a minstrel show? The Parent Teachers Association? Sure. What a perfectly awful idea. Well, I don't know, Eve. It might be kind of fun. Sure it would. Who's that fat lady I done seen you with last night, Jay? That was no lady. That was my wife. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Gildersleeve, what's the best way to raise spinach? With a fork? Any fool knows that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Judge? Uh, I'll be down to meet you in a taxi, honey. I better, I better be, be ready about half past eight. No, no, oh, honey, no. don't be late. I'm going to meet you What do you got there, Leroy? Oh, I got a new way to do the trick, Unc. Is that the Mahatma's magic box? Yeah, I traded it from Craig. So you finally got it away from him, eh? What'd you give him for it, Leroy? I gave him a pretty nice deal, Unc. What did you give him? Well, it might not seem so good to you, but a kid would love it. What was it? A solid glass doorknob. And uh, 20 cents in cash. Well... A deal is a deal, I guess. <laughs> Good night, Leroy. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Music on this program was directed by Claude Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Why worry, homemakers, just because some of your favorite foods are scarce? Here's a very special kind of cheese food that's been helping women to make an endless variety of point-thrifty main dish treats. It's Pabstet, P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food of a hundred uses. Pabstet is rich in mellow cheddar cheese flavor, melts quickly into a smooth golden cheese sauce that gives a grand flavor lift to macaroni, vegetables, eggs, chicken, and fish. Pabstet also blends temptingly into Welsh rabbits and soufflés, slices neatly when chilled, spreads and toasts to perfection for sandwiches and snacks. And it's downright nourishing and easy to digest. Buy both delicious varieties, golden cheddar Pabstet in the yellow package and pimento Pabstet in the red package. Ask for Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food of a hundred uses. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Cheese 
Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore, with music by Claude Sweet. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. About this time of the year, we like to give you June brides-to-be a little special advice. Not advice on how to make your first biscuits, but advice on how to serve them so they'll taste extra good. Just try spreading them with delicious parquet margarine. Your meals are sure to get off to a grand start when you choose a spread that's as delicious and satisfying as parquet. And you'll be getting off to a right start on your food budget, too, because parquet margarine is downright economical. Remember, too, that parquet is tops in food energy value. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So do as millions of homemakers do. Buy and serve delicious, nourishing parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Millions prefer parquet to any other brand. Now let's see what's happening to the great Gildersleeve. We find him opening his morning mail, and among the circulars from plumbers, investment houses, and people who want to sell him a used car, is a letter postmarked, Wistful Vista. Well, Wistful Vista. Is it from Fibber McGee, Uncle Mort? I suppose so, Leroy. wonder what the little squirt wants now. <laughs> is it from Mr. McGee? No. Listen to this, children. Who's it from? The First National Bank of Wistful Vista. Uh-oh. You're wrong, Leroy. <laughs> Listen, dear Mr. Gildersleeve, upon checking over our records, we find you have an unclaimed savings account with us, which we have taken the liberty of transferring to your bank in Summerfield. The amount with interest to date is $209.14. We're rich! Yay! I can't believe it. What's going on in here? We're rich, Bertie. Uncle Mort found some money. Yay! <laughs> my, my, this family gets crazier every day. Stop it, stop it. Now, we're not rich, Bertie. We never will be. You don't have to tell me, Mr. Gillsleeve. I gave up long ago. Uh, <laughs> but apparently I have come into a little money. Where are you going, huh? I'm going to call Mr. Todd at the bank. I'm going to ask him if the money's come in. This might be McGee's idea of a joke, you know. Some joke? No worse than some of the... Oh, hello, Mr. Todd there. Mr. Gildersleeve. But if it is a gag, I'll take that little twerp McGee and squeeze $219.14 right out of his ears. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Todd. I want to find out if you've received a deposit from my account this morning from... You did? <laughs> yeah, that's right, $209.14. Thank you. Stop it, you'll shake down the house. What are you going to buy with all that money, Unc? Well, I'm going to think it over. And in order to think, I need to be alone. And to be alone, I need a cigar. See you later, children. Oh, well, oh, that isn't fair. <laughs> What can I do for you this morning? <laughs> I'll tell you, Peavy. Give me a thousand fifty cent cigars. What's that? Uh, oh. <laughs> shall I put them in a the bag or will you just smoke them here? <laughs> Only joking, Peavy. So is I. <laughs> but it just so happens I could almost buy a thousand cigars today. Had a little windfall this morning. Savings account I'd forgotten all about. You don't say. Yep. I've never been able to forget a penny. It must be a wonderful feeling. Great. But I'm not blowing it all on cigars, Peavy. Let me have three of those three for a half. Yes, sir. That'll be 62 cents. 62 cents for 50 cents worth of cigars. That's inflation, Peavy. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's all taxes. Oh, well. So long as I'm rich. I, uh... I wonder if you've considered investing this windfall, Mr. Gildersleeve. Investing it? Well, I hadn't thought of that, but it might be a good idea. Well, you could spend it, only most of the stuff you buy these days is junk. But after the war... You're I... right. They're going to be reconverting pretty soon. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. The war isn't over. Well, it's all over in Europe. If I take this money and put it into some company with good reconversion program, maybe I can get in on the ground floor or something nice and solid. Television, maybe. Well, I wasn't thinking... Air conditioning, maybe, Peavy. 
for aviation. Everybody's going to own helicopters after the war. I was thinking of something a lot solider than helicopters, Mr. Gildersleeve. What was that? I was thinking of war bonds. Care to buy one? Oh. Well, uh, I'm sorry to bring this up, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I have a quota, and I thought that since you'd come into some money... Well, Peavy, war bonds are a fine investment. Fine investment. Every citizen owes it to his country to invest in war bonds. It helps finance the war, and it helps control inflation. That's what I say. Yes, sir. Put me down for a $25 bond. <laughs> That'll be eighteen seventy-five. Yes, man. sir. Glad to do my bit, Peavy. At the same time, a man's got to think of his future. So I'll just look around for some industrial investments, too. Reconversion is important, Peavy. They need capital. Oh. Oh, various manufacturers. I'll find somebody that needs money. Don't worry. I don't doubt you can do that. Say, what am I worrying about? I got a financier right in my front yard. I'll bet Rumson Bullard knows plenty about investments. That makes you think so. Because he's retired. A fellow that retires has to have his money invested, and he has to watch it like a hawk, Peavy. If he loses it, he's got to go back to work. Dear me. Yes, sir. Should have thought of that in the first place. I'll go see Rumson Bullard right away. Uh, what about the bond, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'll pay you later. <laughs> to Leroy, Uncle Mort. I thought of something really practical. Now, now, I'm not going to buy anything, so just save your breath. Oh, look, I only want an electric saw. It only costs sixteen fifty. But we really need a sofa, Uncle Mort. I'm absolutely ashamed of ours every time Marshall Bullard comes over. I didn't come home to argue with you children, and I'm not going to spend the money on fripperies. I'm going to invest it. Will you get out of my way, please, Leroy? Me? I'd like to go upstairs and put on a clean shirt if you'll permit me. Well, corn's sake, you just got dressed. Well, I'm going over and see Mr. Bullard for a minute, and I Uncle thought... Uncle Mort, the furniture in this house is awful. The couch isn't fit to sit on alone, <laughs> even. <laughs> the discussion is closed, Marjorie. Well, I don't see why you should change your shirt just to go to see Mr. Bullard. You ought to see what he's got on. I'm not changing it for him, Leroy. I just didn't notice when I dressed this morning how worn this shirt was. What's Bullard got on? An old pair of pants like the ones you gave the clothing drive. And a dirty old sweater. Hmm. Is he doing some work in the yard? No, he's just knocking a golf ball around out behind his house. Golf ball? Well, that ought to be easy. I guess I won't change my clothes after all. Well, Mr. Bullard... Another addict of the grand old game, I see. What? Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. You play golf? Do I play golf? I'm afraid I'll have to plead guilty. <laughs> nice putting stance you've got. Uh, Ernie Trafton taught it to me. He's the pro of the Stony Meadows Club out on Long Island. Oh, yes, I've heard of him. Is that where you played back east? Mostly. That was my home club. Most of my friends played there. A lot of uh, Wall Streeters, I presume. Wall Streeters? Well, I imagine most of your friends were big stock market operators, weren't they? Oh, no, no, just ordinary businessmen. Uh, want to try a couple of putts? Oh, thanks. I guess you've played the market in your time, haven't you, Mr. Bullard? Well, I fooled with it a little, but it's bad medicine. Go on, hit the ball. The hole is that tin right over there. Well, that's pretty clever, that little tin. Oh, mm. yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, but as I was saying, I'm thinking of reinvesting some of my investments, uh, some of my funds, Mr. Bullard, and I just thought that maybe as an old market manipulator, you might know a little inside information you'd be willing to pass along to a neighbor. Well, I'll give you a tip. I'm listening, Mr. Bullard. Put your money in war bonds. And if you're not going to hit the ball, give me back my putter. Uh, uh, well, I might as well putt. <laughs> hmm. Not bad. Wait, I'll drop another ball and see if I can beat you. There. Now. We're about even. No, I think you're a little better. Uh, you were with United Refrigeration, weren't you, Mr. Bullard? With them for 20 years, yes. I was wondering, what would you think of United Refrigeration as an investment? Gildersleeve, take my advice and stay out of the market. It's no place for amateurs, as I found out myself. You'll never convince me you're an amateur, Mr. Bullard. Hmm. I'm not even that now. I'm out of it. Well, that is practically out of it. Uh -huh, I knew it. You've still got an interest in the company, haven't you? Well, naturally. Tell me. They'll be reconverting one of these days, won't they? Of course they will. Oh, that is, I suppose they will. I haven't any inside information. Oh, no? 
<laughs> Thanks very much, Mr. Bullard. But what... Uh, a word to the wise is sufficient. But don't worry. I won't tell anybody else. Uh, these millionaires are all alike. Cagey. Trying to pretend he wasn't in the market. Just afraid some more smart people would get in there, too. Make it tough for him. But he certainly gave himself away. <laughs> yes, sir. Just grabbed myself a few shares of that United... <laughs> Leroy! Confound that kid. I don't know how many times I've told him not to leave that bicycle on the side. Oh, Get this bicycle off the walk. It almost broke my neck just now. Can I drive that there? Sorry, Unc. I'm tired of hearing you say that, Leroy. <laughs> Well, there goes my electric saw. Darn the luck. Why did he have to trip over it? Gosh, if I found $200 practically lying in the street, I'd buy stuff for everybody. Expensive stuff, too. I'd buy everything I saw in That's Hogan's department store window. I won't be able to get all this furniture immediately, but if certain plans work out... Oh, Unky, darling. Furniture. Now, now, my dear, there's nothing certain yet. Of course, it isn't certain the sun will rise tomorrow either. <laughs> yeah. How soon will you know? Won't take very long if my calculations are correct. Uh, there might be a waffle iron for you too, Bertie. If you kill Steve, if you buy me a waffle iron, I promise you won't regret it. Yeah, I know that, Bertie. Waffle iron. And if everything goes well, I might even get Leroy that electric saw. But don't tell him I said so. Hee <laughs> <laughs> hee, the old son of a gun. <laughs> Well, I'll play along with him. Jay Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. And now a brief word picture of an appetite-arousing meal. In the kitchen, Mom has whipped up a big batch of pancakes. She flips them hot off the griddle. Johnny grabs one after another of those golden brown griddle cakes and stacks them on his plate. Pass the parquet margarine, please, he shouts, because that's the way they taste extra good. And Johnny's right as can be. Pancakes, waffles, hot breakfast toast, and just plain slices of bread all taste extra good when you spread them with delicious parquet margarine. In fact, millions prefer parquet to any other brand. Millions like parquet's fresh, delicate flavor. They like the energy it helps to provide so economically. And they like the fact that every pound of parquet provides 9,000 units of vitamin A. So do as millions of homemakers do. Buy and serve delicious, nourishing parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's get back to Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve the financier. For three days, he's been following the ups and downs of the stock market, and he's been like a kid on a roller coaster. Gee. <laughs> Fortunately, there have been more ups than downs. Today, the 50 shares of United Refrigeration, which he bought at four and a quarter, have skyrocketed to seven. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Now, when Gildersleeve gets hold of a good thing, he's not a man to keep it to himself. So when he sees his next-door neighbor, Mrs. Ransom, going by, he runs to the window and hollers. Leela! Leela, where are you going? Oh, hello, Strathmore. Wait a minute, I'll be right out. <laughs> Wait up, Leela. What's your hurry? Oh, I'm on my way to the lending library. Miss Trimble just phoned me. I'm next on the list for forever amber. <laughs> Well, forget it, Leela. Come on up on the porch and sit down. Oh, I can't. Oh, come on. I can't. I've been waiting too much for this book. I I'll save it for you when I've finished, if you like. Oh, I'm too busy to do any reading these days. Well, if you're so busy, what are you doing home in the middle of the afternoon? Why aren't you down at the water department? I'm letting my secretary handle that. I have more important things to attend to. Come on. Sit down for a minute, Leela. Mm, you're being very mysterious, Throckmorton. Well, I don't tell everything I know. <laughs> But you'd better be nice to me just the same. Now, why should I be nice to you? What have you ever done to deserve it? Nothing. I just thought you might like to know that I came into a little money recently, that's all. Let's sit right down here on the grass, shall we? <laughs> Throckmorton, stop it. Why should I? Oh, please, there's a little boy coming. Oh, him. Hello, Craig. Where's Leroy? I want him to play with me. Leroy, he's in the house somewhere, I guess. 
Uh, why don't you go ring the bell? Who's she? Oh. <laughs> well, this is Mrs. Ransom. She lives next door, Craig. Leela, this is Craig Bullard. Uh, how do you do, Craig? My, you're a fine big boy, aren't you? Where's Mr. Ransom? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Mr. Ransom is no longer with us. <laughs> now, if you want Leroy, just go ring the bell. I want him to come out. I want him to play with me. Well, just go ring the bell and he'll come out. What are you doing? We're sitting on the grass. <laughs> What does it look like we're doing? I want Leroy to come out and play with me. All right, go get him. <laughs> we're busy here. Gee, God. Uh, just go right up to the door, honey. Don't be afraid. Leroy! Oh, Leroy! Leroy isn't here! <laughs> He's there, all right, Craig. Just walk in. Uh, now, where were we? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> Rock Martin. Uh, you were telling me about some money or something. You stick with me, Leela, and you'll wear diamonds. Uh, I couldn't possibly accept a diamond from a man I'm not even engaged to. Well, I didn't mean that literally. Oh. <laughs> but I can tell you how to make some money, Leela, if you'd like to. Would I have? Promise you'll be nice to me? We'll see. Well, come here. What for? I want to whisper in your ear. Whisper what? A secret. <laughs> What's the secret? United Refrigeration. What? <laughs> United Refrigeration, Leela. It's a stock. I bought 50 shares at four and a quarter three days ago, and already it's up to seven and a half. Is that good? Good? <laughs> if it keeps on at that rate, Leela, I figure in four months it'll reach 132. That's where I sell. And make a tidy little profit. Oh, oh, I think it's so exciting. I've always been dying to make some money in the stock market, but my husband, Beauregard, he was always so conservative. All he left me was some little old municipal bonds. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell them and buy what you've got. And you know what I'm going to do, Leela? I'm going to collect a little broker's fee right now. <laughs> yeah. oh, let go, let go. Oh, silly, here comes Judge Hooker. Oh? Huh? Well, a little gambling on the green, huh? <laughs> you mind your own business, Horace. Oh, Horace, I'm so glad you're here. After all, you're my attorney. You need one? <laughs> well, I suppose I ought to consult you as long as you're here. Hey, you know those little old municipal bonds that Beauregard left me? Sound as a rock with your brawler, Leela, and not a thing to worry about. Yes, well, well, I've decided to sell them. What? I'm going to sell them and buy some stocks, the kind the truck Martin has. Leela, are you crazy? Now, just a minute. Gildersleeve knows absolutely nothing about the stock market. Listen, Why? people go around making such a mystery out of the stock market. It's as simple as ABC, Judge. Just buy when it's low and sell when it's high. That's all. Huh. How do you know when a stock's going to go up? How do you know that it won't go down? Never mind how I know. I know, that's all. I bought 50 shares three days ago at four and a quarter, and already it's up to seven and a half. What did you say was the name of the stock? Ha! I'm not telling. But if Leela here wants to buy some... Uncle Moore! Uh, yes, my dear? Your secretary's calling from the office. Uh, tell her I'm in conference. Tell her I can't be disturbed. I'll call her back. Uh, and Marjorie, yeah? do me a favor. Call up Mr. Todd at the bank again and ask him the latest quotation on United Refrigeration. Ask him what? Just ask him how my stock is doing. He'll understand. I've been in touch with him all day. The market's closed by now. Oh, ask him what time the market opens in the morning. Now, Leela, my advice to you is let the stock market strictly alone. Leela is taking her advice from me, Judge. Well, come to think of it, Horace may be right, Throckmorton. Down home, everybody said poor old Colonel DeLacy never would have shot himself if it hadn't been for the market. And, of course, they're all as poor as church mice now, the DeLacy's. Why, I know of a case right here in town. Man bought stocks on margin, got caught short, wound up committing forgery. In the pen right now. His family's on relief. I hope you haven't bought this stock on margin, Gildy. Uh, he... <laughs> uh, what did he say, Marjorie? Did you get him? What did he say? He said the stock is at nine. Nine? Hee <laughs> hee! That's up a point and a half. What did I tell you? And the market opens at five. Five o'clock in the morning? That's impossible. It opens at nine. 
Oh, that's right. It's the market that opens at nine. He said the stock has dropped to five. Uh, five? <laughs> uh, what do you think, Judge? Do you think I ought to sell? There's not a thing you can do till tomorrow, Gildy. My advice to you is to sleep on it. Sleep on it? How am I going to sleep on a thing like that? I won't sleep a week, Judge. Now, Gildy, I wouldn't worry. I have a very simple rule that I follow in these cases. Oh? Uh-huh. What's that? Buy when it's low and sell when it's high. <laughs> Oh, go on and laugh, you old go. One, two, three, four, four o'clock. I'll never get to sleep. Uh, why did I do it? Why did I do it? Seven and a half. Uh, seven and a quarter. Seven. Six and three quarters. Uh, six and a half. Uh, six and a quarter. Buy when it's low and sell when it's high. <laughs> oh, shut up. Six, five and three quarters, five and a half. Oh, no. Five and a quarter, five, four and a half. What happened to four and three quarters? Four and a quarter, four. More margin, please. But I can't. More margin. Well, give me time. Give me time. Peavy, I've tried everybody in this town. At least you're my friend. You'll lend me some money, won't you, Peavy? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Mr. Todd, please, you've got me with my back to the wall. If you say no, I'm ruined. No. But this bank, I'm an old depositor here. I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. We're not in business for our health. And think of my children, my little nephew, Leroy. Oh. And my little niece, Marjorie. In the name of sweet charity, anything at all. A crust of bread, even. Not for myself, but for my poor old uncle. He can't even go out of the house. He hasn't any shoes. <laughs> Bless her heart. And then there's good old Bertie. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows. How about it, Mr. Todd? Are you going to let these children starve? Are you going to let them sell birdie down the river? Sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. We'll have to close you out. Holy smoke, what's the matter? Um, Pete, what's it for? Uncle Lord Leroy, what's happened? Oh, it's all right. Uncle just fell out of bed. <laughs> uh, what time is it? 8.30. 8.30. The market opens at night. Get out of here. I've got to get some clothes on. I've got to get over and see Bullard. Oh, hello, Craig. Is your daddy in? Where's Leroy? <laughs> Leroy is at home. Is your papa in? I want Leroy to come over and play with me. <laughs> Look, Craig, I'm a little in a bit of a hurry. Yes, it's important. Is your father home? I want to see him. What do you want to see him about? Never mind what I want to see him about. <laughs> Just go tell him I'm here. Someone at the door, Craig? A man. Yes. <laughs> oh, hello there, Gildersleeve. Run along, Craig, and go and finish your breakfast. Mr. Bullard, I don't know if you heard, but United Refrigeration's dropped two points. Well? Well, I thought you'd want to know. I mean, we got to do something. I mean, you've got influence. If you threw your support behind it when the market opens... What business is it of mine? Well, you own stock in it, don't you? United Refrigeration? I told you I got rid of all of that two years ago. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I got rid of all my stock two years ago. But I thought... Yes, sir. I sold out all my holdings and I put in every nickel I had into government securities. Government securities? War bonds. And between you and me, I've never regretted it. No blood pressure when the market drops. No more indigestion. <laughs> and I can sleep like a baby at night. Well, that's more than I can say. After all, I don't know where you're going to find a smarter investment, but uh, then I don't need to tell you. Oh, no. <laughs> no, indeed. Not us smart fellas. 
Well, thanks for the tip, Mr. Bullard. I mean, well, thanks, anyway. Got to be going now. Just thought I'd drop in and say hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, look out there. Oh, I told Craig not to leave that there. Everywhere I go, bicycles. <laughs> Mr. Todd, I've got to see you. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, feeling bullish this morning? I'm feeling terrible. I want to sell out. I want to dump all my holdings. You're sure you've considered this? All night long. Well, after all, you've only held the stock for three days. You don't have to run a horse all season to know when it's a dog. Oh, Miss Von Rath, what's the latest quotation on United Refrigeration? United Refrigeration opened at four and a quarter. That's just what I paid for it. Well, now, it might go up. It might go down. Sell it before I go crazy. Sell 50 shares for Mr. Gildersleeve's account. Now, uh, might I ask you, Mr. Gildersleeve, if you're contemplating uh, some other investment? You darn right I am. War bonds. Mm, a very wise choice. There's no sounder investment. How much shall I put you down for? Oh, no, you don't. I'm buying these from a place I can trust. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, war bonds are war bonds no matter where you buy them. Well, I'm not taking any chances. I'm buying mine at the drugstore. <laughs> Not only that, Peavy, it's your patriotic duty. That's what I'm saying. This war isn't over yet. No, sir. We still got the Japs to beat. That's what I'm saying. You hear all this talk about post-war conversion. I'll bet you don't hear any of that on Okinawa. That's what I'm saying. Any man who doesn't put every cent he's got into war bonds, he's not only unpatriotic, but he's a darn fool. Because war bonds are the best investment in this world, bar none. So don't let anybody come in here and tell you you ought to ease off on the war bonds and put your money into something else. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well? That's what I say. <laughs> Very well. And if I ever do it again, Peavy, I hope you'll give me a good swift kick in the shins. Well, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I mean it, Peavy. Well, goodbye, Peavy. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. The bonds will be mailed to you. And thanks for the order. Not at all, Peavy. Thank you. The great Gildersleeve. Good name for him. What a character. Well, it takes all kinds, doesn't it? That's what I'm saying. I heard that, Peavy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. This morning's program was directed by Claude Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margin and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. And now here's special news about a really different kind of cheese food. A cheese food treat you can serve in a hundred or more delightful ways. It's Pabstet, spelled P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. Pabstet is a different kind of cheese food because it spreads like butter at room temperature, slices neatly when chilled, and melts with luscious smoothness into an appetizing sauce that you pour over macaroni, hot vegetables, chicken, and fish for extra cheese flavor goodness. Pabstet toasts to perfection, too. Makes grand sandwiches and snacks for all occasions. Pabstet is extra nourishing, extra easy to digest, and the children simply love it. Treat your family to both tempting varieties, Golden Pabstet in the yellow package and Pimento Pabstet in the red package. Tomorrow, buy Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food of a hundred uses. This is the National Broadcasting Company.